So just kind of go along with me. Maybe this is a refresher to some of you if you've heard this before. So we know this. At least we've been told Santa lives at the North Pole. You know what? Jesus lives everywhere. Santa rides in a sleigh. Jesus rides on the wind and walks on the water. Santa comes but just once a year. Jesus is an ever-present help. Santa fills your stockings with goodies. Jesus supplies all of your needs. Santa comes down your chimney uninvited. Jesus stands at your door and knocks and then enters your heart when invited. You have to wait in line to see Santa. Jesus is as close as the mention of his name. Santa lets you sit on his lap, but Jesus lets you rest in his arms. Santa doesn't know your name. All he can say is, hi, little boy or girl, what's your name? Jesus knew our name before we were born. Not only does he know our name, he knows our address too. He knows our history, our future. He even knows how many hairs are on your head. Santa has a belly like a bowl full of jelly. Jesus has a heart full of love. All Santa can offer is, ho, ho, ho. Jesus has a heart, excuse me, Jesus offers health, help, and hope. I got it. Health, help, and hope. Santa says, you better not cry. Jesus says, cast all your cares on me, for I care for you. Santa's little helpers make toys. Jesus makes new life, mends wounded hearts, repairs broken homes, and builds mansions. Jesus may make you, or excuse me, Santa may make you chuckle, but Jesus gives you joy that is your strength. While Santa puts gifts under your tree, Jesus became our gift and died on a tree, the cross. How many thankful we serve a Jesus? Amen. It's alive and well and living in our hearts this morning. Amen. We're going to look in Luke chapter 1, verse 8 through 20. So if you've got your Bibles, let's look at this together and read along. Luke chapter, did I say 1? I meant Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, and we're going to be at verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified or afraid. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Mm. These past few weeks, I have taken us through the scriptures and three specific encounters of individuals who met up with an angelic visit or the angel Gabriel. We, we looked at Zechariah and his angelic appearance by Gabriel while he was serving in the temple, being told that he was going to have a son, name him John. 
and that the Lord had heard his prayers, and we know it was a twofold prayer. We know he went in there and he was praying on behalf of the people for the coming of the Messiah. The Lord heard the prayer. Of course, his son John would be the forerunner. And then we had the angelic visit that came to Mary, angel Gabriel, telling him, and she's having the question, how can this be? Since she's just a virgin, how can this be? And the angel told him, nothing is impossible with God. You see, today we celebrate something that is impossible, and yet it happened. God came to a virgin Mary. She conceived and gave birth. Then what about Joseph? And last week, you know, Joseph sometimes gets overlooked in the story. And so last week we looked at Joseph, and Joseph has a, vi has a dream, and an angel appears and tells him the same. And he's going to take him as his own, and he's going to be his son, and he's going to raise him. And so we had those three angelic appearances. But you know, we're going to look once again at the story, and we're going to find another angelic appearance to the shepherds who are watching their sheep by night out on the hillside. We know that our Heavenly Father reveals His glorious truth as He did to Zechariah, as He did to Mary, Joseph, and now to the shepherds. And how many believe that He still wants to reveal Himself to you? Could you imagine what it must have been like to be in the stable that night and what you would have seen with your own eyes? When Jesus reveals himself to me, when God the Father reveals himself to me, my life is changed. How about you? You know, the shepherds' lives were changed. We'll talk about that in a moment. But the, the truth of the matter is, and the, the message of the birth of Jesus must and will change your life. Does this message change you? Does this celebrating that we have of the birth of Jesus, maybe many of you have what we have in our home. We have a manger scene. We have a stable, and we have the, we have the shepherds and, and the camel, and we, we have the camel. <laughs> Sorry, you know. But we do have all of that there as we go up our steps into our house, and it's a reminder of what we're really celebrating. And I love the songs that we've been singing this morning. I loved when we went out Christmas caroling, when we sung the songs of Jesus' birth. But his life changes my life. And I want to take us through the story for a few moments. So join with me with your Bibles open. And let's be reflective for a few moments on the birth of Jesus. We're talking about a journey, first of all, through difficulties. A journey through difficulties. Mary and Joseph, can you imagine for a moment getting your bags packed and you're going to go on an 80-mile journey. You see, you don't read that specifically in the Scripture, but let me tell you something. From Nazareth to Bethlehem was about 80 miles. Now, you and I with our automobiles, that's no big deal, right? But can you imagine the walk? Can you imagine? It's going to take more than one day. And so there they are. They're getting ready on a journey. It's not going to be an easy journey, my friend. You see, the emperor, Caesar Augustus, issued a royal order or a decree conducting a census across the land. This would help, and I don't know if you're aware of this, but this would help. We always think about the taxes, right? But there was something more about it than just the taxes. This would help register the men that would draft into his army to aid in the collection of taxes. Now, the Jews did not have to serve in the Roman army. We know that for a fact. But they did have to pay taxes. Isn't that something? Way back in Jesus' day, they had to pay taxes. And here we are today doing the same. So the government forced Joseph to make the trip from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Why? Because he was of the house and the lineage of his ancestor David. And we talked about that last week. It's interesting to note about the census. While it was necessary for Joseph to make the journey, did you know that Mary didn't have to make the journey? It was Joseph that had to make the journey. Because it was Joseph that was being counted. Women were not required to show up for the census, only the men. So you and I might ask the question, 
Why did Mary, why did Joseph think that Mary needed to go on the journey with him? After all, she's pregnant. This is a long journey. This is 80 miles. Mary, are you ready for it? Let's go. <laughs> Can you imagine being with child and having to make this journey? Let me tell you a, few, a couple of things about this that brings to mind why, why Mary went along with Joseph. First of all, I can think as a husband, my wife, or he, remember, he took her home to be his wife. She's pregnant. But you guys know, remember from la the last two weeks, hometown gossip was all a stir, right? Hometown gossip, hometown rumors. Things were going on that were of a ridicule nature because they weren't married. And she's with child. And they didn't understand all of this about the virgin birth and how the Holy Spirit came and, and she's conceived. So how would you feel, men, if you left your wife behind to face all that alone? Well, you'd make the trek. And there she is. She's pregnant with child and she's going to give birth soon. And you're leaving her behind. So I can understand why he says, Mary, I'm not leaving you here. You're coming with me. And you know what? We don't have anything recorded here. But Mary, I believe she went willingly. She had the right spirit. How many of you know we face difficulties? How many of you know we face some tough decisions? We talked about last week about Joseph and his decision to take Mary home to be his wife. He was going to divorce her privately. This was another big decision for them. Mary, would you go with me? I don't want to leave you. I have to go. And Mary understood what lied ahead. Oh, yeah. It was an easy street. It wasn't paved highways. It was trails. It was rocks and rough terrain at times. They had to go down and up and down and up. They went to, through Jericho. They had to even watch out for the thieves at some portions of the journey. They had to take enough so that they could get comfortable at night so they could be able to sleep. To those who have ladies who have been pregnant before, is it hard to get to sleep when you're far along? And it's, it's hard and it's difficult. Can you imagine sleeping on the ground? Doesn't sound like a lot of fun. And yet, she went willingly. But something else, through this difficulty, through this, what the Roman, the, the, the ruler told him they had to do, he had to do, God was using that to fulfill a prophetic announcement. In Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. You know what I like to tie this together like? How many of you, and I'm sure I'm speaking to all of us, have walked through a difficult time not under, fully understanding why God is allowing it to happen. We don't see the big picture. Mary and Joseph couldn't see the big picture. They could have grumbled and complained like a lot of people do. I got to go to Bethlehem and pay my taxes. I got to go to Bethlehem and, 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 and the census thing. And you know what? We're no different. Why is the church going through things today than we never did 10, 20 years ago? Why are we walking through difficulties? God's got a purpose. Yeah? He understands what the devil's doing. He understands the world systems. But you're not of this world. But yes, we have to submit. We have to pray for those in authority over us. We, Jesus said... Give a render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Yes, we walk through this life in times of difficulty, but God's got a greater purpose. I don't care what difficulty you're going through. Are you a child of God? Do you know Jesus? I can tell you right now, you're an overcomer. <laughs> I already can tell you the end of the story. Because Revelation says, heaven's for the overcomer. Heavens for those who have walked through all of the difficulties of life, and yet we know we'd like to complain. Pastor George, I still remember your message on complaining. I listened to it. I wasn't here, but you preached, and I listened to it. 
You see, that's where we're at. That's where Mary and Joseph are at. It was a journey of difficulty, but God had a greater purpose to fulfill something that was prophesied about hundreds of years before. We're out of you, Bethlehem. Not out of Jerusalem. I mean, you think we got big plans of how God should do it. Jesus is going to be born in Jerusalem in a palace and to the, to the elite and to those who have money and royalty. And, you know, he's going to be well taken care of as far as society is concerned. But none of that happened. God had a different plan and a different purpose. Notice when they arrived to Bethlehem. The Bible does not say that Mary actually rode on a donkey. Did you read that in there? I didn't read that in there. But that's what our story is. That's how we portray it, right? And most likely we put the dots. Have you ever put dots together to try to come up with a solution? Most likely, you know, donkeys were those animals that carried the burdens, carried the luggage. And yes, most likely would carry Mary, even though it's not actually recorded here. I have a feeling Mary rode a donkey, and that had to have been rough. She probably says, i got to get off this donkey and walk a while. After all, 80 miles. And so she did her share of walking, I'm sure. But we see them arriving. And, and, and as they arrive, we, we understanding something more about the story. They don't even have baby clothes with them. I mean, you, you know you're going to have a child. you got to pack that, that luggage. You know you got to have all the new outfits for the newborn. I mean, you know what I'm talking about? All the new outfits, all the, we got to, we got to, Joseph, I'll go with you, but I got to bag, I got to pack my bag for that baby. No, they went with just the bare necessities. We know that God always provides, right? We think we have to have all of this stuff. I need this, I need that. People are celebrating Christmas in the last few weeks and today and maybe this week as well. And we get a lot of new things. We open packages when, and it's stuff. And it's like, we'll either say, this is what I need or this is what I wanted. Right? But the bare necessity. Jesus came into this life with just the bare necessities. Mary and Joseph. They, they had to use strips of cloth called swaddle to wrap the baby Jesus so there was no new things hanging on a hanger for her to put on the baby, right? They used whatever they could. So we're talked about the journey of difficulty, which we all face and we all go through, but what about the revelation of hope and salvation? Once again, we talk about the shepherds, church, and this angelic appearance on the hillside, which we just read about. Can you just imagine for a moment being those shepherds? I always like to do that. Have you ever read the, you read the scriptures and put yourself in there? It's just, it's just an amazing thing to put yourself right in the story. And the shepherds are there, and they're just minding their business, taking care of the sheep, maybe sitting around the fire, telling stories. It's dark. Got to make sure the sheep don't wander. Got to make sure the sheep aren't going to be attacked by some by some an wild animal. So they're, they're doing their, they're minding their business and all of a sudden an angel shows up and makes a declaration and then there's the sky is lit up. How I many of you like to go out on a clear night and look up at the stars? <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Just to look up and you just look in all directions and see the stars in the sky. Can you imagine looking up and everywhere you look, just doing a 360 like I'm doing right now, and you're looking up, and all you see is angels singing a glorious song about the, behold unto you is born this day, city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. It's an amazing thing to think about how the Lord would show himself and reveal himself this way to ordinary shepherds, not to the religious crowd, not to the teachers, not to anybody of so-called royalty, but he showed up to simple shepherds. They were faithful with their work. Jesus himself referred himself as a good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. What do we learn from this? We learn this, that God wants to reveal himself to ordinary people just like you and me. You don't have to have a degree next to your name. 
You don't have to say, Pastor Dave, you know, you get better revelation because you went to Bible college. Fooey on that. So what? God's concerned about your heart, not about your degree. He's not, he's not concerned about what places of leadership and authority you've carried over your life or what you have right now behind your name. He's not concerned about all any of that. He's making a point, isn't he? We're going to show up to the shepherds. Angels, they're like, where are we going? I thought we were going to go to Jerusalem to the religious people, the religious crowds and the teachers and those who know it all. No, you're going to go to the shepherds on a hillside. So I say to you this morning, that same Lord who by those angels appeared to the shepherds wants to appear to us. Are you ready for that? We're going to move into a new year. This is our last time we're together in this year on this Christmas day. even. And next Sunday, we'll be into a new year. And I'm praying with you that the same God who with the angelic appearance to the shepherds on the hillside would once again reveal himself to us. Which takes me to that third point, the encounter of his presence. And so we can encounter him personally. Now some of us are like, I want that angelic appearance or I won't believe God. Come on, you don't need an angelic appearance. But those are nice, and those would be awesome. But didn't we read and didn't I share with that illustration with Santa and Jesus that your heart, we just have to let him in. We just, he's knocking. We just have to let him into our life. We can have an encounter with Jesus. We can have an encounter with the Lord. But let's look at the stable. So here the shepherds are and they're like, you know what? We're going to go. And the scriptures say they went in a hurry. They went in a hurry. Now, hopefully nobody was in a hurry to get to church today. You took your time, right? But think about being in a hurry. You guys all know what it's like to be in a hurry. I get behind somebody driving through town, and I'm like, oh, no. Maybe you know, i got to be careful because it could be one of you. <laughs> I'm like, oh, boy. <laughs> Give space. They're going 15 miles an hour down through by the courthouse, heading through town. And I'm like, I just need to get home, but going 15, come on, people. And, it's, and there's no snow and there's noise. How many of you have ever been tested in that? I'm in a hurry. You know, you go through that drive through and you're like, oh, really? <laughs> We're just creatures like that. But this was such important news, such life-changing news. The Savior, hey guys, the one in whom we've been waiting for. The one, we're the generation, we're the ones. We get to go see him, and they believed in their heart. How many of you know if they're in a hurry, there's something stirring in their heart? How, much, how many of us are stirred about spiritual things? Are we stirred about spiritual things? Are we stirred about those things that build up our faith? That, 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 that stir us on to live a life that's pleasing to God and a life that lives for righteousness? How stirred up in our spirit are we? Something we have to ask ourselves. You know, even when it came to David, and he'd been on the run. David understood what it was like to not be in God's house, to, to be in the run and being hiding in the caves. And then he says in the word, he says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. He had a desire in his heart to experience God's presence and experience it with God's people too. I just ask us this morning again as we talk about our life and where we're at with this story and, and, and how God is wanting to reveal himself to us that we realize that God he simply comes to the door of our heart. A stable, will you? He came to a stable Born in a stable? Some say it could have been a cave or a barn even. But whatever it was, we know this for certain. There was livestock around. And how many of you know, Jim, you're a farmer. Can they smell a little bit? <laughs> and they're dirty? He knows. Can you imagine out on the farm putting a, putting a, a manger in there, a feeding trough? And Mary and Joseph are out there. And they wrap the baby and put the baby Jesus in a trough. 
Just think about it for a moment. That's the humbleness of Jesus coming to this earth. He took upon himself, the Bible says, human flesh in Philippians chapter 2. He took upon human flesh. He became a servant. He became just like us. He was not born in a hospital. He wasn't born in the inn, in a nice comfy room in bed and warmth. But he was born in a stable. Yes, a lowly place, a dirty place. But God chose this earth and this kind of place, not a palace. And here's what I think part of the story is that we miss. Are you with me? God chose to come in a place like this to make a statement. It doesn't matter how dirty. It doesn't matter how rough your life has been. Where you've come from. It doesn't matter if you've got tattered clothes. You smell a bit <laughs> with the word. He came just like that to make a statement that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord can be saved. Is it true that Jesus, you know it's true, gave a parable of the son who is out in the pig pen. Can you imagine the father running and greeting his son who smelled like the pigs? Jesus had a lot of good reasons why he told the parables. There's another part of the story. The Father don't care how we smell, where we've come from, what we look like. I mean, you know, we all get bent out of shape by appearance. Man looks at the outward, was told to Samuel, when he was looking to anoint who was going to become king, right? Went down the list of the sons. He comes to little David. God doesn't look at the outward. I mean, excuse me, uh, God doesn't look at the outward. He looks at the heart. That's what man does. We look at the outward appearance, don't we? And so the story that we read here and what we, what we understand here is an encountering with the presence of God. By the way, I don't think those shepherds smelt so good either. Right? They didn't have time to say, let's go clean up before we head to the stable. That was just common for them. They're keeping sheep, man. It's no big deal to them. Hallelujah. They were accustomed to that. It makes little difference where Jesus was born if he's not born in your heart. He's got to be born in your heart. That's why Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Understanding that there's, there's a significance between the stable in which Jesus was born and the condition of our own heart. Before you can be saved, you got to admit you're a sinner. You know the song Amazing Grace? How many really identify with the words? Who saved a what like me? A wretch like me. You see, we are all sinners undone except for the grace and the mercy of God. And when we think of the story this morning about Jesus being born in that stable, in that manger, listen, I'm telling you something. It reminds me that no one's without the opportunity to come to Christ because he will come to those who ask. It's been said this. Kings are born in palaces. Donkeys are born in stables. I just had to quote that. I, was, I almost missed that. That reminds us, though, that God allowed his son, the king of kings, to be born in a lowly stable. Again, having Jesus in your heart is what truly makes you a follower of Jesus Christ. It says this in 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 and 12. Let me read it to you. 1 John 5, 11 and 12. And this is the testimony God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Jesus says he is the light. He is our life. There's no place on earth worthy of God's presence. Think of it. The Almighty God. This earth is under a curse because of sin. There's no place on earth really truly worthy of God's presence, but he chooses to reside in your heart. Think of that. Oh, God. Think about how we live. 
Think about how we serve. Think about our, what is important to our life. The priorities that we have in our life. Oh God, as we move into a new year that's coming. Lord, help our priorities come in line with what's most important. One thing I've realized as I've grown older, and that does happen, doesn't it? I got another birthday coming. It's like, really? I thought we just got done with a birthday. Here it comes again. I mean, you understand that. It's like, what in the world? I'm finally going to catch up to Elaine and uh, Pastor George and Christine. We're all gonna, I'm catching up, okay? This is my week to catch up to the rest of you. <laughs> How's it feel? <laughs> the point is, is I'm realizing, you know what? Julie says, what do you want for this? What do you want for that? I said, I just want my family. I want us to be healthy. I want us to have our family. I really don't care about things I can buy with my, my money. I, yeah, it's nice to have little things or hobbies or things that we enjoy. And, you know, there's, there's necessities and stuff. You know what I'm saying. But to just realize what's most important in life is not the things that you can't take with you to heaven. It's who you can take with you. And I know sitting around the table with my family at Christmas last Saturday, I'm emotional. It's going to happen, Elijah. You know. Just sitting around the Christmas, sitting around the table for Christmas, having family there. Some of you haven't been able to be with your family. My prayer is you'll get to. And and Lord will give you opportunity. But just to be able to sit around the table and realize that's my family and that's what I can take with me to heaven. Puts everything else in perspective. So Lord, hear our hearts today. We want your presence. And finally, the proclamation of the good news. This is another thing that you and I can be doing with what we know from the Lord this morning. The shepherds left the stable. No, they could not stay there. They had to leave. How many of you know we're going to be leaving church? You can stay here if you want. You might be here alone all day. But, I'll, you know, you can stay. And, uh, but there's a time to move on. There's a time to, to go. He, they, have, they have sheep. Remind, oh, that's another part of the story. Who's watching the sheep? <laughs> you know, when God's in it, he's going to take care of the little things. He is. He's going to, you think it's a big thing, but God says, I got this. Have you ever heard that phrase, got it? Just go. Just go. We worry about things we shouldn't be worrying about. They didn't worry about their sheep because something greater was going on in their life, and they didn't want to miss it. Oh, my goodness. Hey, so they're there at the stable. They see the, the Christ child. They spend however long they spend there. But then they leave and their life has been forever changed. They leave. I don't hear in the scriptures them talking about, I wonder how our animals are. I wonder what's going on back at the hillside. All I hear is they're going out and they're just letting it go. I mean, we're talking in the middle of the night. They're making some ruckus. They're being fanatical. They're being radical. They're letting it shine. How many of you know we should be the same? I love this part of the story every year when we get to it. I just love to think about the shepherds leaving, running and jumping. And You guys know how to run and jump yet, those of you that are a little older? Do you know how to do that? You run, you jump. I've seen people on video. I'm No joke. I was watching on Facebook a video when... Uh, <clears throat> Michigan won a very important game and these grown men like myself they were videoing themselves jumping up and high-fiving and the whole thing and I thought you know what I serve a risen savior Jesus is alive I can shout I can give a I can give a, a praise to the Lord I can proclaim who he is listen Jesus has been born Jesus has been born kind of reminds me of that story of the Scrooge he wakes up, remember, from all of these past, present, and future, and he realizes he still has his life to live, and then he goes running through the city. How many of you have watched the, the story? The, 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 and, well, and even um, with Jimmy Stewart, what's it called? Wonderful Life. It's on my tip of my tongue, Wonderful Life. And he's running through the city, and he's giving Merry Christmases to everybody, Right? And he's being generous, and he's just loving people, and he's loving his wife and his kids. How many of us realize where we've come from and where God is taking us and that we have a life to live for Jesus and we can tell others about him? 
I want us to be that kind of people. We've got life. The Son has set us free, and we're free indeed. I want us to be like that song says, Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills. What's the next phrase? And everywhere that Jesus Christ is born. I want you to bow your heads with me. We're going to come and we're going to sing one closing song today. And as we have our heads bowed and our eyes closed, just think for a moment again how his birth brings change to your life. His birth brings change to your life. Maybe you're here today and you're on a journey of life and you're, running, you're going through some difficulties. Mary and Joseph faced many on that journey to Bethlehem. Whatever it is you're facing, know that God has a plan that you sometimes can't even see. And he's got a purpose in it all. And he will fulfill and establish and do what he has set out to do in and through your life. It might take years. Yes, it may take years. And you'll look back and say, that was God's plan. That was God's purpose. Whatever it is this morning, I encourage you to stay true, to stay an overcomer, to stay in your faith with him. Maybe you're here and you need a revelation of who he is again and his truth to your life. My prayer is today that as the Lord appeared to them on that hillside through those angels, that God would appear to you today in your heart because he's at the door of your heart and he wants you to let him in. And to encounter his glorious presence as they did on the hillside, but also in that stable that night. When they saw the Christ child, the glorious presence of God was there. Emmanuel, God with us. Are you there, my friend? And are you with me today? And make a decision with me, will you? I'm going to proclaim that Jesus is King. He's Lord. He's Savior. And I'm not ashamed. I'm bold. And I'm going to do that for him. I want you to stand with me this morning. And I want you to sing this closing song that we know so well, Silent Night, Holy Night. And I want us to remember and think about how that birth has changed our life. Let's sing it together.